We will get started. Uh, welcome to our webinar on sexual violence in the workplace, making the connections. I am Jen Benner, the Resource Development Specialist at NSVRC, and I am joined by Donna Greco, Training and Technical Assistance Director. And I just want to thank everyone again for joining us today. We recognize that the content in this webinar may be upsetting, especially for people who have experienced sexual violence, so please take care of yourselves during this time. And as Jen mentioned, a recording of the webinar will be available online after the presentation if you do need to step away to view the information at a later date. So now we'd really like to um, know more about who is on the webinar. We have about 33% of advocates joining us today. We have some folks from the medical uh, field. We have a few folks from law enforcement, um, technical assistance providers, and some other disciplines. So welcome and thank you for joining us. And folks are already using the public chat space to share their organizational affiliation, so please continue to do so. And hopefully um, after this webinar, you'll be able to connect with each other um, and continue this conversation. Uh, so next we're just going to talk briefly, uh, the NSVRC uh, just um, released an information packet on sexual violence and the workplace. We are very excited that this uh, information packet has been released. Um, it is, all the documents are available for free for download on our website and uh, Jill should have just sent a link out to where those documents can be found. Um, again, everything is free from download and I'm just going to briefly uh, just let folks know what is included in that packet. There is an advocate's guide to prevention that uses a spectrum of prevention um, to make the connections between sexual violence and employment and offer possible prevention strategies. There is an annotated bibliography that uh, highlights resources and research on the connections between sexual violence and employment. Um, we have, there's a bulletin that uh, sexual assault counselors and advocates can use to help uh, survivors identify how their sexual violence experiences have impacted or could impact their employment. There's an employer's guide to prevention that is specifically geared to employers and how they can uh, respond to sexual violence in the workplace and also prevent sexual violence in the workplace. Uh, there's an overview that just lists general statistics and information about sexual violence in the workplace. There's a research brief, um, a resource list that has a lot of different resources that are available online and um, various guides and manuals and things. And there is also a technical, or excuse me, a um, guide on the temporary assistance for needy families program. So, and that program, um, ta or excuse me, that guide talks about using TANF to help support survivors of sexual violence. Donna, is there anything else you wanted to add? So. No, we just want to really thank our presenters and their respective organizations for their permission to be a part of this webinar today. Um, we have wonderful speakers with great expertise in this topic. Uh, Mandy Mundy is the Director of Education and Training at the Network of Victim Assistance in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, where she has worked for over 15 years. Mandy is responsible for curriculum development, training, marketing, and training implementation. She developed NOVA's Training Institute for Professionals to raise awareness and skills of professionals who work with crime victims. Jesse Mindlin is the Victim Rights Law Center's National Training Director. She's been active in the sexual assault and domestic violence movements for over 30 years. She has worked as a clinical law instructor, legal aid lawyer, coalition staff attorney, rape crisis counselor, domestic violence advocate, counselor for runaway youth, and a waitress. Maya Ragu is an attorney with Futures Without Violence in Washington, D.C. Her work primarily focuses on the intersection of gender, immigration, and the workplace, and she is an expert on legal issues concerning the workplace effects of gender-based violence. 
She leads the work on a Department of Justice funded project, Workplaces Respond to Domestic and Sexual Violence, a National Resource Center, which we'll hear more about later. So today we really hope that um, by the end of our time together we have a greater understanding of some of these complex connections between sexual violence and the workplace, both sexual violence that occurs outside of the workplace and its impacts on people's employment, as well as sexual violence that occurs within the workplace. Um, again, we, we really feel this is sort of the beginning of a conversation. We really hope to stay connected with you all as well as with the experts we're going to hear from today to continue to collaborate to prevent sexual violence in the workplace. So take it away, Mandy. Thank you. It's wonderful to um, be here with everyone today and to have the opportunity to speak about this very important topic. Um, I wanted to start by saying that sexual violence in the workplace is violence, and as advocates, as 33% um, of other people who were identified on the poll as working for or with victims of crime, we want to begin to think about sexual violence in the workplace as a strong form of violence. Because in a typical week in the United States, the average worker spends approximately 55 hours, or 33% of their time, participating in work-related activities. Many people spend more time at work than they do at home or with family members. So where we spend our time and how we spend our time impacts our overall health. As we see here on the um, continuum, sexual violence affects everyone and crosses all socioeconomic lines. However, power imbalances and social inequities caused by oppressions that we see there in the center, such as sexism, racism, classism, ageism, ableism, heterosexism, all influence sexual violence and may be exploited by people who commit sexual violence. Oppression then can, in turn, create risk factors for sexual violence and can compound barriers for victims of sexual violence um, seeking or assessing help for traditionally marginalized populations. So, for example, traditionally oppressed groups such as undocumented or documented immigrants, people working in the restaurant and service industry, people living in poverty are at increased risk for sexual victimization um, in schools, in home, and in the workplace like we're talking about today. In the workplace, it's helpful to understand and share with employers the complex ways that those oppressions in the center affect migrant farm workers, immigrants, people of color, women, teens, people who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, people with disabilities, people living in poverty, and others, all people of whom are working in their system. And the workplace really is a system. We'll talk about that as we start talking about systems advocacy. So sexual violence constitutes a continuum of harmful behaviors ranging from sexual harassment to rape, what we see on the outer side of that sexual violence continuum then. Another way to look at that continuum is through the roots of sexual violence, that systems of oppression are characterized by dominant subordinate relations that allow one group to benefit at the expense of another group. So what is sexual violence as we're addressing it today? It is any sexual act, attempt to attain a sexual act, unwanted sexual comments or advances, acts to traffic or otherwise direct against a person's sexuality using coercion by any person, regardless of their relationship to the victim, in any setting, including but not limited to home and work. And of course, today's webinar is focusing on sexual violence in the workplace, but we'll address how sexual violence in the workplace affects an individual outside of that environment. Coercion, important to pull out in this definition, can cover a whole spectrum of degrees of force. Apart from physical force, it may involve psychological intimidation, blackmail, or other threats. Uh, for instance, the threat of harm or of being dismissed from a job or of not obtaining a job that is sought or being demoted or not receiving a promotion at that time. And that emotional coercion can be very strong on an individual basis. It's really in the eye of the beholder when we talk about um, psychological or emotional intimidation or coercion. Looking, in order to help us look at the prevalence of sexual violence in the workplace, we must really first take a look at the magnitude of the problem of sexual violence overall. And as we see depicted here, because of the many complex layers of reasons, 
um, including societal shame, blame, or other factors that still very much are associated with sexual violence in our community and in our world. Sexual violence overall, let alone sexual violence specifically in the workplace, is underreported. Therefore, we can see how the connections between sexual violence and the workplace are understudied. However, even limited existing research can help inform advocacy and prevention efforts, and some of what we do know about the prevalence of sexual violence in the workplace is that 38% of women studied had experienced sexual harassment in the workplace. That's a large percentage of women who are going to work day in and day out forced to be in a hostile work environment or a quid pro quo environment that creates an unsafe and unhealthy workplace. And those are the 38% of women who reported it or who admitted to it in the study. Another study found that between 8 and 13% of individuals returning to public assistance have reported experiencing sexual harassment at work. And in traditionally male-dominated professions like military, women may experience more sexual harassment and violence. In fiscal year 2010, over 3,000 military sexual assaults were reported. About a quarter of those occurred during deployment in a combat zone. When we talk about the impact of sexual violence, there's a number of different categories to consider when discussing that impact. Um, Sexual violence can cause interruptions in a person's whole life, not just their work life. It's estimated that post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, is likely in about 50 to 95% of rape cases. Sexual violence that occurred in the past can also affect current employment. We're not just talking about sexual violence that occurs now in the workplace, but how it may be impacting somebody's current employment. One study found that childhood sexual abuse can often result in difficulties in the workplace in adulthood, leading to poor job performance and work absenteeism in adulthood. Some of the psychological or emotional consequences of the impact of sexual violence include things like stress and anxiety, depression, um, it reduced internal focus or control, lower self-esteem, shame or guilt, helplessness, anger, aggression, possibly even suicidal behavior. When we think about those psychological or emotional consequences of sexual violence, whether the sexual violence occurred outside of the workplace or inside the workplace, now how those psychological and emotional consequences are affecting the individual while trying to do their work, it ultimately does result in decreased job performance or attending work because somebody may not be able to get out of bed and therefore they may not be promoted or they may receive a demotion or they may not be um, rehired at the end of a contract. The impact of sexual violence, of course, affects somebody physically also. Headaches, nausea, chest pain, cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, the list can go on and on and on. Weight gain, loss, fatigue. And how does somebody function at work when they are uh, severely fatigued because they're unable to sleep at night or when their headaches are so severe they can't concentrate on the computer screen? In one study, 50% of rape victims lost or were forced to quit their jobs in the year following the rape due to the severity of their actions, of their reactions, apologize. The National Violence Against Women survey found 19% of adult female rape survivors and about 9% of adult male rape survivors said their victimization caused them to lose time from work. Over 21% of women who were raped by an intimate partner lost time from paid work, with eight days as the average number of days. So sexual violence is really interrupting the workplace. The impact of sexual violence, of course, continues with financial losses and the economic impact, including decreased, decreased productivity, discretionary effort, work quality, safety, increased turnover, absenteeism, even increased disability claims. Sexual violence can create a significant financial burden on health care, criminal justice, education, child welfare, and a whole host of other systems. In 2008, Total victimization costs of each rape were about $151,423, or the lifetime income loss 
due to sexual violence in adolescents is estimated at nearly $250,000. A study of the cost of sexual violence in Iowa in 2009 estimated that the cost of lost work due to sexual violence to be over $131 million. Sexual assault victims lose approximately $2,200 due to decreased productivity and lost wages in the aftermath of sexual violence. Sexual violence in the workplace is violent. Systems advocacy is a key strategy for social change. How do we begin to address sexual violence and sexual violence in the workplace? The goal of systems advocacy is to improve systematic responses to victims of domestic violence and sexual assault in their communities. Through participation in uh, commissions and projects and task force committees and collaborative efforts, coalitions are able to positively impact systematic responses to victims in their communities. We as advocates are able to positively impact our communities. Systems advocacy also offers networking with community partners and agencies supporting domestic violence and sexual assault survivors providers across the stage or across the, the states, across the country. There are a wide variety of workplace people here on this webinar representing different walks of career paths, all working together to create systems advocacy for social, social change around sexual violence in the workplace. So an opportunity to share your thoughts a bit. In your role, what are some of the ways some of the ways, what are some of the things you can do for systems advocacy? And you can share that answer in the public chat box. These may be some things you already are doing and an opportunity to share, or some things that you want to begin to start to do where you may be looking for resources. And we see some of those answers coming in, training munici municipalities, I'm going to have an opportunity to move my part of the presentation into talking about the local perspective and what we do here in Bucks County. And one of our trainings is a sexual harassment in the workplace training. And we specifically outreach to, large to all of our municipalities in our county for trainings through their HR department, um, through their, through their um, risk management departments even. even sharing best practice on primary prevention strategies. Other people are talking about work, providing workplace trainings, partnering with local agencies as a prevention educator. And again, many of these experiences will be um, some of what I share with you from that local perspective moving forward. So continue to chat in that chat room there and share your, your, what you can do for some systems advocacy and social change. So sexual violence permeates our society. That we know, um, including the workplace. That is a part of our society. Employers are a system. Employees are a part of that system, and businesses are a system. The true magnitude of sexual violence as it relates to employment is unknown when we go back to looking at that triangle and the magnitude of sexual violence. So it's unknown for a number of reasons, but one of which is the lack of comprehensive research on the topic overall. However, of course, as national awareness about harmful and far-reaching effects of sexual violence grows, more and more advocates and employers are taking steps to work together collaboratively, as you're talking about in the chat room, to effectively address and prevent the devastating impacts of sexual violence in the workplace. There are so many different systems affected by sexual violence, medical, mental health, criminal justice. These are some of the places you could and should be outreaching to to provide trainings, corrections, uh, general workplaces, childcare, schools, universities, law enforcement, military, other social service organizations are all systems in which we can affect social change. Sexual assault advocates and prevention educators play an important role in preventing sexual violence in the workplace and in educating communities about the many impacts that sexual violence and trauma can have on the workplace. It's important for advocates to reach out to employers if you're not doing so already or if you can increase those efforts to provide resources and training on why employers should care about sexual violence, how it impacts them, the discussions we just had on the economic and the physical and the emotional impact 
of an employee when sexual violence and how it affects the workplace. Why sexual violence prevention training is a good part of their business plan is a great way to approach an employer to affect social change. Advocates are leaders in coordinated sexual violence prevention efforts. We're the ones, we are out there doing the work to continue to work with workplaces. Advocates are well prepared to educate and train employers on the dynamics of sexual violence and to create comprehensive approaches to healthy and safe work environments. There are packets, the NSVRC's work, a Sexual Violence in Workplace packet is incredible information right in the, the palm of your hands to be able to use to train employers. And then effective prevention strategies addressing sexual violence before it occurs by engaging in strategic, long-term, comprehensive strategies which engage multidisciplinary partners can help create positive, healthy social norms, ultimately reducing the risk for sexual violence and increasing protective factors. These efforts can reach audiences multiple times in meaningful ways that expand skills and change behaviors and empower communities to help create those healthy social norms we're all working towards. Strategies are most effective when developed with diverse, multidisciplinary community partners and tailored to the strengths and needs of the audiences and to that workplace specifically. When employers are understanding of the issue of sexual violence in the workplace, its root causes, the need for prevention, and are willing to implement policies, the positive effects are felt not only at the individual level, but throughout the workplace and the community and society as a whole. In order for policies and action to occur, the employer needs to be con committed to the issue of preventing sexual violence. So a little bit from the local perspective of our workplace trainings as a um, nonprofit, uh, Bucks County-based victim service agency rape crisis center, there are a few workplace trainings we implement that help address sexual violence in the workplace. We do offer sexual harassment in the workplace training called Options. And we know that sexual harassment is one form of sexual violence. So some of the first advocates who fought against sexual har harassment in the 1970s uh, came out of the rape crisis movement. Um, two groups formed in the 1970s, uh, Women Working United and the Alliance Against Sexual Coercion, and both groups um, had different views on the case causes of sexual harassment and differed in their approach to ending sexual harassment. However, the ties to the rape crisis movement are evident. So rape crisis centers, victim service agencies, are primed for providing sexual harassment in the workplace prevention programming. The goal of sexual harassment prevention training is to help prevent all occurrences of sexual harassment in the workplace. And failure to adapt and implement a proactive approach to preventing sexual harassment can result not only in legal consequences for a company, but also a loss in employee morale, decline in productivity, quality of work or a blemish in the company's good image or good standing in that community. So those are the reasons why a, an employer would want to have you come in to provide sexual harassment prevention training in the workplace. Um, organizations that may provide training um, to their employers could avoid punitive damages, employment lawsuits, could assert a defense to harassment lawsuits, they're following the EEOC guidelines, they're also following state laws and state guidelines. So there are some requirements for sexual harassment training in the workplace that your training agenda can address for them. So that's one way to reach out. And I know from your chat room conversation that many of you are doing sexual harassment trainings. There are resources out there that are helpful for you. Another training that we provide um, quite often is workplace bullying. Um, workplace sexual violence is a part of a larger societal issue that requires true systematic change. In partnership with advocates and prevention educators at local levels, employers have the opportunity to make significant changes in their communities. Through modeling responsible policies and practices, they can impact employees, vendors, customers, clients, their community. Workplace bullying often involves an abuse or misuse of power. Bullying behavior creates feelings of defenselessness and injustice in the target and undermines an individual's right to work to dignity at work. work. Bullying in the workplace is not workplace politics. It's not incivility or simple rudeness. It's not the routine exercise of, of acceptable managerial prerogative. Bullying in the workplace is violence in the workplace. In addition to training, um, 
We have also are, have a community collaborative partnership here in Bucks County called the Bucks County Health Improvement Partnership. Um, sexual violence research demonstrates its pervasiveness and the profound negative effects that sexual violence can have on individuals. Survivors often experience the effects of sexual violence across the lifespan. In all of Bucks County's major healthcare providers, in our medical society and in our Department of Health, we work together towards a common goal to dramatically impact the quality of life, especially for Bucks County's most vulnerable citizens. With the collaboration of all the Bucks County hospitals, the Bucks County Health Department, the Bucks County Medical Society, and many of the nonprofit agencies, um, a report was conducted in 1994 which led to the incorporation of BCHIP, this Bucks County Health Improvement Project. BCHIP developed a variety of different task, task forces um, and programs to address the needs and opportunities identified through that report from 1994. The Domestic Violence Task Force is one of the task forces that came out of the BCHIP general report. And it's a task force working to increase awareness of domestic violence and to promote universal screening and counseling of patients in healthcare settings in Bucks County. We know that domestic violence is a public health epidemic that affects 4 million women in this country. The Domestic Violence Task Force is a partnership that really addresses domestic violence when it enters the workplace. The Domestic Violence Task Force has been successful in implementing policies in all of Bucks County's acute care hospitals and the Department of Health, providing training for hospital and health department staff, physicians and volunteers through bank, brown bag lunch, staff in services, uh, y'all come type of, of training, routine screening of hospital and clinic patients for domestic violence, and awareness campaigns with partner institutions and within the community. So those are three examples from the local perspective, two examples of trainings and a very strong collaborative approach to addressing sexual violence in the workplace. When you think about how you will address sexual violence in the workplace, it's important to think about the spectrum of prevention, which is a systematic tool um, that promotes a multifaceted range of activities for effective prevention. The spectrum identifies multiple levels of intervention and helps people move beyond the perception that prevention is merely education. As we see by looking at the successes of BCHIP and the, the Domestic Violence Task Force, it's not just all about awareness seminars. The spectrum is a framework for a more comprehensive understanding of prevention that really includes six levels of strategy development. This is a blueprint for a multi-level effort for you to begin to implement some of the things that you hear about and learn about on today's webinar. Um, new policies and procedures with a proactive focus on prevention will really lead the way to healthy, safe, and violence-free workplaces. So I thank you all and will certainly help answer questions at the end. Hi, good morning or good afternoon for those of you who are on the East Coast or in between. This is Jessica Mindlin, and I'm with the Victim Rights Law Center. I'm the National Dra Director of our Training and Technical Assistance. So first, I just want to thank NSVRC and also OBW who funds us for giving me this opportunity to talk with you all. Just very briefly, I'll say the Victim Rights Law Center, we are a technical assistance provider for LAV grantees under OVW. And in fact, we ourselves are LAV grantees. We provide free individual holistic legal representation to victims of sexual assault in Massachusetts and in Multnomah County, Oregon. That's a brand new project. And our focus is on victims of non-intimate partner sexual assault. And we've also done a lot of work with, our, um, with expertise on staff regarding farm worker victims of sexual violence and then also on homelessness. And here's a, I'm going to move kind of quickly through these first few, just our contact information. So if you want to follow up with us afterwards, you have a way to do that. And briefly, just to summarize what my objectives are for the brief time that I have with you today, is just to identify at least three laws that can help provide the basis for employment remedies for sexual assault survivors. And just a brief explanation on what the difference is when we're talking about the federal laws in Title VII, which all talk about sex discrimination 
and then sexual harassment, but we're talking about sexual assault and articulating those differences, and then identifying three employment-related accommodations that advocates can offer and to help negotiate or achieve for survivors. And Sorry, I'm trying to get the hang of doing all of this. Um, on the, we call, kind of call this slide our, our minds map. And it's always the starting place for us in our providing holistic services as we think about what is it that survivors need. And also, where is it in the context of this presentation that employment may be impacting the survivor's experience. So how, does, where, how are employment and immigration related, for example? Or how are education and employment be connected? So for example, perhaps a student who is a work-study student, or privacy in the workplace. And we're really moving at this point in, the, in the, this webinar from the systemic advocacy to the individual advocacy, and that's what I'm going to be focusing on. And you know, again, kind of our, our approach to this work is really what can we do as advocates, as lawyers, to help spot what the issues are that survivors are encountering with respect to sexual assault in the employment context, and then what can we do to help craft a solution? I just want to check in briefly. I hear someone saying that they're not hearing anything. If you can, in the chat, just indicate whether that's true for all of you or just for, for some of you. Okay, it says to make sure that my audio, um, someone is saying I can hear you just fine. All right, you all can hear. So I'm going to keep moving along then. If someone needs help, uh, just indicate that. So just I'd like to hear from all of you using the public chat. What would you say are some ways that you have experienced for survivors that sexual violence impacts a victim's employment? And please just go ahead and chat, uh, share your answer in the, in the chat box. So I'm dreading going to work, and that's connected to the next point, which is some mixed, missed days at work because you're dreading it because the survivor is taking time off for court. Um, missing work, is the, uh, Mandy was saying, sometimes the survivor just you know, doesn't sleep well at night, can't get in there. The performance in the workplace and how the sexual assault may impact a survivor's uh, self-confidence the lower productivity because of those issues, because of absences, et cetera. These are all terrific points that, that you're making. And certainly I think for all of you who are working with survivors directly have experienced this. So the focus, um, I said we want to start off with being able to spot the issue so that we can then help craft a solution. And these are just the ways in which we would be starting the conversation because they're really, sexual assault can impact a survivor's experience in the workplace because the assault happened at work, but also if the assault did not happen at work, it may have happened somewhere else. In fact, it may have been completely not work-related, but nevertheless, for all of the reasons that you just identified in the chat space, is impacting how the survivor is performing in the workplace. And then, of course, when it has happened at work, all of those experiences are really exacerbated. So the starting place is to have a discussion with the survivor. Just opening the door is, has the sexual assault impacted your work? Because he or she may be coming to see you for a different reason. And in order to be able to spot this issue, you need to open the door and have that conversation. And then, of course, the follow-up kinds of questions, which is, who is the perpetrator? Is he or she connected to the workplace? Are they coming into the workplace? And if it is work-related, was it reported to anybody in the employment context? And what was the response? And we'll talk a little bit more as we look at some of the employment laws and remedies why this particular question is important in terms of what employers' legal responsibilities are to an employee. 
And then again, in order to be able to craft the solution, to ask the survivor, what kind of support do you need at your work? What would help you address uh, the impact that you're experiencing? And the starting place for a legal response or doing legal advocacy to help survivors achieve the remedies or the solutions that they're wanting is, okay, being able to identify what are the relevant laws. And there are you know, depending upon each state or the territory or the jurisdiction or your community, the laws are going to vary somewhat. So I decided just to give you a broad overview of what are kind of the, some of the most significant ones. And the three key federal laws that I've listed here are Title VII, the Americans with Disabilities Act or the ADA, and what's often referred to as FMLA or the Family Medical Leave Act. And I'll be talking in a little bit more detail about these in just a moment. And then we also have state laws that we can turn to. Uh, typically, there is an equivalent at the state level of the federal Title VII and Americans with Disabilities laws. And there are also insurance, unemployment insurance benefits. And I'll give some examples of what states are doing with their laws in terms of promoting survivors' rights. And then some workplace protection laws that are, may or may not be specific to d victims of domestic violence or sexual assault or stalking or dating violence. So I want to kind of start with Title VII because that's always the one that we hear the most about. And I gave you, for those of you who want it, the, the citation. It's at 42 USC 2000E. That's what that is. And if you just put that into Google, it would bring up the Title VII law. And the key things to know about Title VII is that it prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex. So you may not treat male employees different from female employees. and uh, sexual harassment is considered a form of sex discrimination. Title VII does not apply to every single employer. The federal law says that you have to have a minimum of 15 employees, and the employees have to be working a minimum of 20 weeks per year. The other thing that the federal law says is that before you can sue the individual employer, you must file a complaint with the Equal, Opportunity, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And that's what the EEOC stands for. And I'm not going to kind of go on. I mean, it'd be, we could be do a whole other 90-minute webinar on, specifically on the legal remedies and what happens you know, when you get a right to sue letter from the EEOC, et cetera. But just know that at the federal level, you have to file with the EEOC, and that you may also have state equivalent requirements. So for example, I'm in the Oregon office of the Victim Rights Law Center, and you'd have to file with our Bureau of Labor, Labor and Industries. Um, and that there are a variety of different damages that a victim who uh, has been found to be discriminated against can ask for. That includes both back pay and also front pay. It can include pay for a promotion that the individual might have gotten, et cetera, um, punitive damages, emotional distress, pain and suffering. And that's really kind of in a, in a nutshell about Title VII law. And we also have the Americans with Disabilities Act. And sometimes folks are like, well, what does the ADA have to do with a sexual assault survivor? And it's because of the trauma that the survivor experiences may rise to the level of a disability. Or, of course, you may have a survivor who, is, who had a disability before the assault. But in terms of the, the trauma and how the victim experiences it, um, it has what is a disability, and the federal law says, well, it has to be a physical or a mental impairment that, quote unquote, substantially limits a major life activity. And of course, work is a major life activity, and the employer is responsible for making reasonable accommodations. And we'll talk a little in just a few minutes about what might those reasonable accommodations look like for a survivor who needs workplace remedies or workplace accommodations. And I mentioned a moment ago that sometimes it's like, well, wait a minute, Title VII prohibits sex discrimination. What does that have to do with sexual assault? And so just very 
briefly kind of hit the highlights here, Title VII says you may not discriminate on the basis of sex. And there are court cases that, from the U.S. Supreme Court that say sexual harassment is a form of sex discrimination. And then furthermore, there also the courts have established that sexual assault is a form of sexual harassment. So just to kind of lay it out, that's how we get under the Title VII remedies when we are serving and looking for how to help under the law victims of sexual violence and sexual assault in the workplace. I've included here, and I'm not going to spend much time on this slide, I just wanted to make sure that you had it in case you were looking for it. What is the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission's definition of sexual harassment? And then a reminder, of course, that there, it's not just federal laws that you want to be familiar with when you're trying to explore what are the uh, legal options or what are some legal remedies that you can tap into when you're helping a survivor. And state laws may, in fact, provide greater protections for victims. So for example, under Title VII, you have to have 15 employees that are working 20 weeks or more per year. You might have a state law that says you only have to have five employees to come under your state protections that are prohibiting sex discrimination. And then there are also some laws that might be specific to what survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking, and or dating violence are experiencing in the workplace at the state level. Or there might be unemployment benefits. And I'm going to provide just some examples here for us to look at. And I've given them to you just from three different states. So here in Oregon, we have a statute that says specifically, employers must provide reasonable workplace safety accommodations and a time off from work for survivors to address safety matters. And know that I included in the resources section links. Legal Momentum has a great website where they list, um, they have links to all of these laws. So don't worry about you know, jotting it down. It's in the resources section. I had to link to them. And you can see there whether or not your state has such a law. Um, unemployment benefits or UI benefits. Montana, along with a number of other states, says that if a survivor has to leave work because of domestic violence or sexual assault or stalking, that you may not deny the survivor unemployment benefits because they left their job. So in many states, if you quit your job for what the state thinks is not a valid reason, they can deny you unemployment benefits. And so we've been successful in lots of states in passing laws that say if a survivor has to quit his or her job because of sexual assault or these other forms of violence, um, then you can't deny them orders. Excuse me, you can't deny them benefits. And then similarly, in addition to, uh, well first of all, every single state allows a domestic violence victim, there's some mechanism for a DV victim to get a civil protection order. You might call it a TRO. In our state we call it the Family Abuse Prevention Act order. But it's still unfortunately only a minority, a growing minority, but only a minority of states that have civil protection orders for victims of non-intimate partner sexual assault. So if you've been assaulted by you know, a stranger, a classmate, a coworker, in many states you're not eligible for a civil protection order. But some states do have remedies that specifically allow an employer to go to court and get a restraining order on behalf of themselves as the employer. And I see that some of you have questions whether you are asking specifically whether your state has these benefits. And again, in the resources section I've included the links, or you can always email me afterwards and I can make, help you make sure that you get there to find out in your individual state whether such remedies exist. So I mentioned at the very beginning that our role as advocates, as lawyers, is to spot the issue and then to be asking questions and help sorting out what is it that the survivor needs and how can we help achieve that. And now I, oh, I always get confused here because <laughs> I'm going to read it to you, um, read this scenario to you, and then um, 
I'm going to click to the, the next slide where we actually have it. Um, so just be, bear with me for one moment because I'm going to have to um, switch slides to, to bring it up. So Karen was on a business trip with her boss and with Roger, who's a company merchandiser. At work, Roger routinely makes sexual comments about women, including Karen's coworkers. And periodically, he sends Karen offensive sexist cartoons. He links to advertisements with intoxicated women in their underwear. And he suggests that as the company buyer, she might be interested. He also tells what Karen's boss describes as quote unquote off-color jokes. Karen has forwarded these emails and complained several times, but the boss told her just not to be so sensitive, quote unquote, it's a guy thing. So Karen is nervous at this business dinner, and she has three or four drinks over the dinner. Roger said that his room was right by Karen's, and he would escort her back. Once back at the room, Roger takes Karen's room key. He guided her inside. He begins to fit, kiss, and fondle her. She's nauseous. Roger helps her to the bathroom where she vomits. Afterward, Roger pushes her down onto the hotel bed, and he rapes her. The next day, Karen flew home with Roger and her boss. She has not been, to work, been back to work since. So those are the scenarios. What are some suggestions and use of public chat of what you think you might be able to do for Karen or what Karen might need, even if you're not sure exactly how to achieve that for her? I'm just going to give folks a minute or two to digest the scenario and see what suggestions you might have. One point, person's pointed out that you know, the, the, the easy answer is yes, absolutely, that uh, Karen could report to law enforcement. What other kinds of accommodations or help if Karen were a survivor that you were working with might you think about? talking to her boss, um, talking to someone who does legal advocacy about what are her rights, seeing if her boss will do something. And she has indicated in the past that she has forwarded and complained, and he's basically told her not to be so sensitive. That doesn't mean he's going to respond similarly with respect to a rape. She might leave her job. Then if you go back to all of those sort of circles that we'd identified at the beginning, what's the impact, of course, on our financial status and our ability to pay her rent, to meet her obligations, um, informing the human resources folks, or if there's an employee assistance program, getting some mental health counseling and resources and support, um, contacting the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, there's the issue of medical care, if she wants to have a rape kit. A number of you have mentioned just reaching out to rape crisis centers or advocacy lines for support, um, resources for temporary benefits. So you're identifying a lot. And we're going in the next few slides, just in the remaining time, identify some other things that Karen might want or that other survivors might want and some remedies that you might be able to pursue. And again, the, be you know, the beginning conversation is what is it that Karen wants? And asking what are your needs? Are you wanting to go back to work? And, and what accommodations might you want with respect to that? Do you want to report it to law enforcement? Do you want them to fire Roger? Does fire Roger work for the same employer? Well, it, that wasn't quite clear in the facts because it says that he's a buyer. You might want him barred from the workplace. Um, so starting with kind of these questions, the safety planning, hopefully all of you are doing, those of you that are doing direct services. And I've just started to list out some examples. Does Karen need time off from work? And if so, where will you look to to see, obviously, vacation time? There may be personal leave. Um, she might have um, 
other remedies under her state law. It might be that she want, wants a different schedule, that if she knew that she could be working from home, for example, or working if there is an evening shift, or transferring to a different location where she would never see Roger again. She might want Roger barred from the workplace. Um, getting an email change if Roger has been sending these sexist emails. Uh, she might want short-term leave, might be long-term leave. And then you're thinking, okay, so how, how is it that we could accommodate if what she wants is time off? You know, some of the parent ones are the vacation, sick leave might be available to her. Um, depending upon the level of trauma that she's experienced, she might be eligible for medical leave. Um, also, depending upon the, the level of trauma, it might mean that it rises to the level of a disability. So there may be disability remedies that, you know, short-term disability or long-term disability. Uh, on the side of protection orders, they may, there may be a sexual assault protection order available to her in her jurisdiction, or there may be an employer one. Um, there may be stalking because there have been these unwanted contacts in the past. And then, of course, as advocates or our attorneys, we're hopefully experts in helping a victim identify where is that documentation? Has she saved her emails? I mean, it would encourage all of you to be always, when we're working with any survivor, to be doing work-related safety planning. I know that sexual assault-specific safety planning um, is not, not all organizations have great tools for that when we're talking about non-intimate partner sexual assault where it's not the power and control wheel, etc. cetera. Uh, we actually just submitted our safety planning guide uh, and template to OBW for approval, so hopefully we'll have that available to you all soon. And then, you know, again, kind of just some other specific ideas are maybe she wants to see Roger get transferred. Maybe she wants to see Roger get fired. Obviously, that requires disclosing to the employer about what happened. We see when working with survivors, there's always a trade-off between their privacy rights and concerns and the ability to pursue specific remedies, whether that's telling the employer or filing for a protection order. There may be some retaliation from Roger and addressing that. Um, and looking for any kinds of compensation. If she refers to law enforcement, some of you mentioned that there may be crime victim compensation. If she does go in for the forensic exam under the Violence Against Women Act, the states have to agree not to charge her. And I, this is just an example that our Oregon Bureau of Labor and Industries um, put together promoting information about our Oregon specific law for the rights of survivors in the workplace. And just quickly, as you look at this flyer, what is it that strikes you? Is there anything apparent to you as you look at this pamphlet that was put out by our EEOC equivalent? So commented that it's, it's, it's targeted to employers, yes. Anything else anyone notices? Who does it say it's, it benefits? Unemployment insurance for whom? Or what is it recommending folks do? Yeah, and one of you just noted that it's completely focused on domestic violence. It's unemployment insurance for victims of DV, DV leave law, DV policy, et cetera. But when you look at the law, it actually affords protections to victims of domestic violence and sexual assault and stalking. And yet, I mean, it's really sort of an example of a good thing and a bad thing. It's great that they're getting the word out to employers, but it's really heartbreaking that it's all about domestic violence victims and not just about victims of, of sexual assault or stalking. So you know, part of it is advocates, when we are doing the systemic work, it's really ensuring that the information that's put out there is reflective of all of those survivors who can benefit from uh, the information or from the legal remedies. And another thing that advocates can do is just to help gather documents. So let's say the survivor was, um, has an signed an employment agreement. What did the employer agree to provide? What kind of notice, if any, may the survivor have agreed to provide? With respect? Is there a complaint process? Uh, who is a designated uh, sexual harassment or human resources person? The CBA or its collective bargaining rules. 
what are uh, the union rights that a victim may have. Look at an employee's handbook. So there's often that's where the, the grievance procedures are set out. So the, you can help the survivor educate him or herself about what the process is for getting time off or for filing a complaint or for quitting and still protecting whatever severance pay, for example, they might be entitled to. What promises or representations is the employer making about safety in the workplace? Uh, also be talking with the survivor, who else was present? So for example, in the scenario that you, we use with Karen and Roger, her boss was there. That's somebody who would be able to testify about how many drinks she had if she was intoxicated, um, because consent, if this were being going forward, is likely to be an issue. And what, um, you can help an employee request his or her employment records, and I've just given you an example here again. Just as this is an Oregon statute, again, many if not most states have them, that says when an employee is entitled to his or her employment records, and whether the employer may charge, how, many, how much time the employer has to get it. So if a victim wants to see, okay, what's in, in my employment file? Because it may be all wonderful things. And then if the employee goes to sue the employer for his or the employer's response to the sexual assault report or lack of response, all of a sudden bad things may start appearing about how this is a problem employee, et cetera. So that's a great way to, for you to uh, be able to support a victim in saying, these are your rights and these are the ways to assert them. So again, I've included a lot of resources that I know were incorporated into the resources page. We here at the Victim Rights Law Center, I always joke and say, pay no attention to our name because we're not the National Crime Victim Law Institute. We should be called the Rape Victim Rights Law Center. Our focus is exclusively on sexual assault with um, victims of actually non-intimate partner sexual assault, and we're a TA provider and always here to serve you. So thank you for letting me join you, and I'm going to turn it over now to Maya Ragu. Great. Thanks so much, Jesse. Hi everyone, thanks so much for being here. Um, please let me know in the chat function if you can't hear or if the volume is low and we can get that taken care of. So I am going to pick up on some of the threads that Mandy and Jesse mentioned in their presentations and give you an overview of our national project and our national effort to engage employers and unions on this issue in a way that's comprehensive and victim-centered and victim-focused. So I work for Futures Without Violence, which is a national nonprofit organization. We're based in San Francisco. And our goal is um, social norm change around gender and gender-based violence. So we actually don't do any direct service provision for survivors. We're engaged in system reform and system advocacy, as Mandy mentioned earlier. So we work with healthcare providers, with schools, with campuses, employers, judges, court systems, all these different systems to get them to change the way they think about gender-based violence, including sexual violence, why it's acceptable. We train them, we educate them, and hopefully then we plant the seeds for them to go forward and, and change social norms in society. Um, Futures Without Violence is one of eight partners in the Workplaces Respond to Domestic and Sexual Violence National Resource Center. And the, the National Resource Center um, was created and funded by Department of Justice through the Office on Violence Against Women as part of the Violence Against Women Act. And it was created to address not just domestic violence, but also sexual violence and stalking and the way that they impact the workplace. And the emphasis is on prevention and response. And the audience is really something that's non-traditional stakeholders for the Department of Justice and for the Office of Violence Against Women, which is looking at employers and unions and helping them understand um, the way that these forms of violence impact the workplace, how they can be supportive of victims, how they can hold perpetrators accountable, how they can reduce economic costs and safety and human costs due to the workplace impact of violence. We're also working to assist advocates to educate workplaces to assist victims and hold perpetrators accountable. So we're working in a lot of different ways. And Jill has pasted the link to our website into the chat so you can take a look there. 
Um, as I mentioned, we have several partners in this project, including our host today, the National Sexual Violence Resource Center, um, Jesse's organization, the Victim Rights Law Center, Legal Momentum, which is one of the organizations mentioned earlier, which does a great job keeping track of all the state laws that assist survivors on these issues, as well as several other organizations, including the Stalking Resource Center. So our project is really focused on four different types of strategies, if you like. We are doing outreach to employers and unions and advocates as well. Um, we're doing training and technical assistance for them. And we created our website, which is the hub of a lot of web-based tools and resources, some of which are interactive, that we use in our outreach and training. So here's a screenshot of our website. Um, there's a lot of information on it, and I encourage you to take a look at it later. Um, and in, the materials on it were created in collaboration with all our partners, and we're working really hard to make sure that it's inclusive of sexual violence and stalking issues and not just domestic violence. So this next slide is a screenshot of one of the quizzes on the website, and even though it says domestic and sexual violence, it also includes stalking as well. Um, we have an interactive training exercise. This one's focused on domestic violence in the workplace. We have another one that should be going up shortly, two of them actually, that are focused on sexual violence in the workplace. Um, we have a page with union responses, and I'll talk a little bit more about our union outreach and the way we've been working with unions to get them to address this issue, both on behalf of members who are victims and victims who are, uh, sorry, employees who are perpetrators. And we have a resource page that lists a lot of resources specific to the workplace, those that are specific to the different forms of violence, and some legal resources as well. So I wanted to talk a little bit about our outreach and training strategy. And this will be familiar to a lot of you. I noticed in the chat functions that you have been reaching out to some of these groups as well as you do trainings or you're doing presentations to raise awareness about sexual violence and its impact on the workplace. On the union side, um, what we've seen is that about 10 years ago, our organization actually did work on a project with unions to raise their awareness about the way, in that case, domestic violence was affecting their members and the things that the unions could do to help their members maintain their jobs, to hold perpetrators who were members of the union accountable, and really just get the union leadership more involved and aware of this issue. Um, we are working with them again, and we see that unions are still aware of the impact of domestic violence on the workplace, but they're really, the issue of sexual violence and stalking is sort of more new to them. So to the extent that you all have the capacity and the ability to reach out to unions um, in your community, I think that would be a great resource for them. Um, although sexual harassment is something that they've been doing trainings on for a long time, they're still coming to grips with some of the overlaps between sexual harassment and sexual violence or um, the ways in which sexual violence affects their members inside and outside the workplace. So I would encourage you to do that. What we've been doing is focusing on the civil rights committees, the women's committees, and the safety and health committees as our points of entry for outreach because those are the people who are sort of most receptive to the issue and have good connections to the leadership of the union who are the people that can make things happen. We've also been reaching out and doing trainings for union educators and trainers. Those are the people who are conducting safety and health trainings or um, workplace safety trainings or who write curricula for unions on different types of trainings. So they're good allies to have. We reached out to labor mediators because those are the people who are mediating grievance issues sometimes between union members and um, management. And this is a new issue for them about domestic violence, sexual violence, and stalking and the workplace implications. So we've been doing a lot of work trying to educate them as well. Um, we've been working on engaging men as allies. You know, Although women are making up a greater and greater proportion of the labor movement now, there's still a lot of men within labor unions, especially the more trade-focused labor unions. And it's important to get them on board, especially if you're doing social norm change about gender and gender-based violence. Um, they, are very, they can be much more persuasive to their peers in many, in many ways. Um, in addressing this issue, and that sort of includes issues around bullying as well. 
And finally, 10 years ago when we worked with unions, we developed a, a training manual for them, which is linked to on our website on issues of domestic violence. And that's being updated now to start to address sexual violence and stalking issues so that unions can start addressing these within their trainings as well. In terms of businesses, like many of you, we have been reaching out and training HR and EAP professionals, either within organizations or in terms of their big trade associations or membership organizations. Because HR and EAP are often sort of the first people within the workplace who become aware when um, an employee's um, work performance or you know, they're having issues related to sexual violence. Those are the people who sometimes first have a clue about what's going on. So they can be very important allies in making sure that they're doing what they need to be doing in a victim-centered way, that they are um, reaching out and forming partnerships with service providers and other community stakeholders, and that they can be the leaders within their organizations to um, implement, developing and implementing a more comprehensive workplace program to address the ways that domestic and sexual violence and stalking affect the workplace. And as I said, um, our emphasis is also on prevention and response and comprehensive programs. So it's not enough for a workplace to put together a policy. That's an important step, but a policy is no good if you don't do anything with it, if you don't train, and if you don't make it a living document. Um, so there's a lot of other components that go along with that. And a new thing that we're going to be starting, hopefully later this year, is we developed a pilot site. We're developing a pilot site project so that we want to pick a handful of businesses across the country in different places, different industries, different sizes, and work with them to develop this comprehensive program to address the workplace impact of violence in terms of prevention and response. And one component of that will be to require them to form partnerships with local service providers and other community stakeholders, because that's a really important part. And this is something that Mandy brought up as well, of how this needs to be a comprehensive community response. It can't just be the, the workplace on its own. Um, so there's two other sort of groups that we've been working with. One is the federal government. And many of you probably know that last year President Obama issued a memorandum requiring all federal government agencies to develop and implement policies addressing the workplace impact of domestic and sexual violence and stalking. Um, in February, the federal government came out with a guidance for federal agencies that had some very, very specific details and requirements on what should be in those policies. And I think Jill had pasted in the link to that earlier. Maybe she can do that again. Um, so we've been working with them as part of our grant to provide training and technical assistance to the federal agencies on developing these policies and the training going forward. We're also working with the National Resource Center on Domestic Violence, which is funded by HHS to think about how do we create a national technical assistance plan? Because if we're, federal agencies have to have policies and we're encouraging them very strongly to form partnerships with service providers in their area, then the service providers are going to get a lot more calls for assistance. And we want to make sure that there's a plan for how that's going to be handled and that service providers have the capacity to address that. Um, the other thing we're working on at the federal level is Jesse had mentioned the EEOC before. And in October, the EEOC issued a fact sheet that for the first time sort of spoke explicitly about the way that Title VII and the ADA, which are the two of the federal employment discrimination laws she mentioned, the way that they can apply in a workplace situation to domestic violence, sexual violence, and stalking, which is pretty significant. And the EEOC now is doing trainings for advocates and coalitions across the country on what this fact sheet means and how they can use it to help survivors. Um, so that's something that we've been working with them on as well. And finally, in terms of advocates, um, we've been working with the different coalitions, doing trainings at the regional and national conferences to help advocates think about how to assist survivors to maintain employment. Um, and in a minute, I'll show you a guide that we have on our website. And also helping advocates think about how can you work with workplaces or unions as a partner 
in helping them come up with this workplace program so that they're proactive and they're not just waiting for something bad to happen because I think we all know that's when a lot of workplaces first start thinking about these issues is when something happens to one of their employees, maybe they have to fire them, maybe there's some sort of really horrible incident in the workplace or away from the workplace and then they think, oh my gosh, we really need to get on this both to avoid liability and to make sure nothing bad happens to anyone else. And then of course a lot of you are already doing trainings in the workplaces in a variety of ways. So this is a screenshot of the guide that we did for advocates in collaboration with our partners and it goes through a lot of different aspects of this, assisting victims but also assisting businesses and unions to address this issue and then partnerships with other community stakeholders. So let's stop for a minute and take a poll um, and this is going to launch in a minute so that you can um, answer. And I know that a lot of you already answered this question in the chat. How many, how have you helped a business or union conduct any of the following activities? And you should choose yes or no. Make a presentation to workers about understanding and responding to domestic violence, sexual violence, and or stalking. You've supplied information about resources to help survivors. Or you've helped a business develop a workplace policy. I will take a few minutes so people can answer. Yes, sorry, I should also say that um, I mentioned the EEO fact sheet and that's included in the link of resources at the end. Okay, for some reason, for me, Everyone's responding in the chat and not on the uh, not on the poll. People are saying the poll doesn't work. Okay. That's okay. Let's take a few more seconds and you can just answer in the chat. Looks to me like it's about half and half so far. Okay. Great. A lot of you have done these activities, so you're sort of already well on the road in terms of helping change the culture within workplaces, which is fantastic. Um, so I just wanted to take a minute and take a look at some of the things that you are doing to engage workplaces. Um, as I said earlier, many of you responded to, I think, one of Mandy's questions, and it seems like a lot of you are already working with HR professionals or with EAP, with stewards, um, within unions, or maybe legal counsel at where an organization has reached out to you to help with the training, probably because they've had an incident in the workplace and they want to make sure that they have some program in place to avoid liability. Um, maybe many of you are engaging with employers because they've come to you for referrals or as a resource to come in and do trainings. Maybe they, I've seen, I see that a lot of you have done general education or awareness raising trainings about violence and the workplace impact and resources to assist survivors. Uh, maybe some of you have done trainings specifically for supervisors, union stewards, and coworkers about their response in these situations. Um, and finally, the other thing that we're doing, and that's something that Mandy mentioned that she's doing, is really trying to engage employers and unions to have a comprehensive program in place. One that's including both prevention and response, that's victim-centered and that makes it very clear that there's accountability for perpetrators. And that's a really important part of prevention because as we're doing this work, it's really important to make sure that workplaces and unions are thinking about victims and their needs and being conscious of those, but it's also really important not to let them forget that their employees and their union members are also perpetrators and that there are responsibilities that these workplaces have and they could be facing liability if they don't do anything about it. Okay, 
So for our project, this is the framework that we've been using as we go out and we talk to and we train businesses and unions. We are telling them that they need buy-in from the leadership and giving them strategies to address that. Um, we're asking them to put together a multidisciplinary response team. We're asking them to create a culture of support for victims and accountability for perpetrators. And that includes putting together policies and protocols to do education and training within the workplace and to form partnerships with community stakeholders. And I'll just go through these really quickly. Um, obviously, support from the top of an organization is pretty important to allow them to use time and money to address the issue. So part of that is making the business case, right? What is the economic impact of violence in the workplace? And a lot of the materials that NSR, NSBRC put together have the research that's out there. There's not a lot, but whatever's out there has been collected. We have some of that on our website as well. Um, just information about all the legal requirements. That is a big selling point for businesses too, to get them to do something. Um, and then we encourage them to partner with their peers um, and other associations, whether they're industry or other unions, to learn from them and let them know that you know, they're not alone and other people have done this and it's possible. The multidisciplinary response team is basically saying to organizations, if something happened in your workplace, you know, who would need to be involved? Get those people in a group together and have, make sure everyone knows their rights and responsibilities before something happens so that you don't waste time and everyone's working together. And that helps maintain the victim's safety and privacy in these situations. So HR, EAP, legal, security, management, union steward, or any others who are relevant in that workplace. Um, in terms of changing workplace culture, um, some of the things that I mentioned before, we want to create, and then we want workplaces to create an environment where victims feel comfortable coming forward, revealing information. Um, or even coworkers. We want victims to feel like their privacy and their safety and their choices and their autonomy are being respected. Um, we want workplaces to emphasize that there is accountability for employees who are perpetrators, which can help perpetrators um, feel like they shouldn't be doing something before they go too far down a road. And there's a couple of studies out there from Vermont and Maine that have shown that if supervisors had said something to perpetrators or if perpetrators known there had been a policy, they would have thought twice or not done, um, engaged in the, in the abuse or the stalking or the sexual violence. And finally, the role of coworkers as upstanders. And what that means is you don't want coworkers to be bystanders because that implies a certain amount of passivity. Um, what we are encouraging is that coworkers can take steps to be supportive but not intrusive, um, and that they should know, you know the number for EAP or for HR so that they can provide that to someone who they think is a survivor or maybe a survivor who has reached out to them for assistance so that they can give them help without prying. Um, but that the victim will feel supported within that environment. Um, a lot of workplaces, especially hospitals and healthcare settings, um, have high rates of sexual assault or sexual violence against their employees for various reasons, but a lot of them also don't take steps to address safety issues related to that. So if it's appropriate, we encourage workplaces to do sort of a general safety assessment and think about issues in light of sexual violence or domestic violence or safety. Obviously, if there's an incident involving a particular survivor, then we suggest that they work with the victim and if the victim wants a service provider to come up with a workplace safety plan. And Jesse mentioned that VRLC has one that's specific to sexual violence. So we would encourage using that, um, assuming that's what the survivor wants. Um, and these are examples of awareness raising activities that you all have already um, indicated that some of you engage in. The recognize, respond, refer model right here, the three R's, is part of coworkers as upstanders, right? It's coworkers noticing that something is different about their friend or coworker, and that's the recognized part. The respond is 
responding in a non-specific and supportive way. Hey, I noticed you haven't been yourself lately. Is something wrong? Can I help? Um, I'm here to talk if you want, you know, if you need to talk to someone. So not making any judgments about whether they've been a survivor of sexual violence or sexual harassment or stalking or domestic violence, but expressing support. And then the referral is if you need help, you know, here's the number for EAP or here's the number for HR, and that's it, leaving it at that. So again, the survivor doesn't feel like someone's making them do something, respecting their autonomy, but expressing support for them and giving them a concrete way to seek assistance if they need it. Um, another part of changing the culture is having a workplace policy that addresses these issues. So here's a screenshot of the policy creation tool that we created for our website. And what it does is it takes into account um, the location of the organization and the number of employees they have, and then it automatically incorporates information from those state and local laws that Jesse was mentioning. And we relied very heavily on our partners at Legal Momentum for the research to create this tool. Um, and finally, education and training, which a lot of you are already doing. This can involve training for EAP and HR staff, which is part of what we're doing, um, and it can it can include um, training on the policy for the relevant managers and supervisors or stewards and union officers. These kinds of more specific trainings can be done during new employee orientation. Um, and what we found that seems to be popular with unions and some of the um, businesses that we've talked to is they would really like a module that could be added on to sexual harassment training or safety and health training that incorporates this information. Because all of us that are coming from the victim services and TA world, we would love to have a multi-hour or multi-day training to really get at the root of sexual violence, why it occurs, how to be victim-centered, and the way it affects the workplace. But you know, a lot of businesses just don't want to hear it or they don't have time for it. And so to get the message across, we're trying to do it in a way that you know, will, will fit within what they can offer us. And so we're working on trying to develop a module for this. And a lot of the information in it will hopefully come out through our outreach and the pilot type projects that we've been working on. Finally, the last step is partnership with the community. These are things that local service providers can do that you're probably already doing. And as Mandy mentioned, we also encourage unions and businesses to form partnerships with law enforcement, with both the civil and criminal court systems so that they understand how it works and that they can be supportive or play an important role in supporting a victim in any of the proceedings. And also with healthcare providers for all kinds of reasons, both to raise their awareness of these issues, also to avoid insurance discrimination against survivors and a whole host of other issues. And with that, I think we will leave some time for questions. And there's my contact information. Feel free to email me after the presentation if you have any questions. And thank you. Thank you to all of our presenters. Uh, we will. We have a few minutes left. I know we're cutting time a little uh, close, so if folks need to hop off, that's fine. But if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to type that in the public chat box, and our presenters uh, will respond um, as necessary. And if no one has any questions right now, um, again, like I said before, feel free to email us at, N or at resources at nsvrc.org. Again, that resources at nsvrc.org. Um, and we'll be able to answer your question. Our pleasure, and thank you for, for organizing it. Um, that was Jesse, by the way. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jesse. Thank you, Jesse.